Good afternoon, everyone. I'm JC Gonzo, Marketing Coordinator here at the Center for Contemporary Arts. Thank you for attending this Living Room Series event. We're doing this type of programming through the COVID-19 closures, and I'd just like to take a second to talk about a couple of programs we have coming up. So later tonight at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, we're gonna have Peter Simonson, the Executive Director of ACLU New Mexico, speaking with Bridget Amiri, who's the ACLU's Deputy Director of their um, Reproductive, Freedom, Reproductive Freedom Project. Yeah. And um, their talk is gonna center around the new documentary, The Fight. Then on Tuesday, we're gonna have um, the amazing filmmaker, Zacharias Canuck, speak with his producer, Norman Kahn, on the evolution of indigenous cinema and their latest film, One Day in the Life of Noah Piatek. So you can register for these at ccasantafe.org and also check out everything else we have coming up. Now I'd like to introduce our guests. So with us, joining us um, from, I believe, France, because he's traveling, um, we have filmmaker Yoni Leiser. So Yoni finished his first feature-length documentary on William Burroughs featuring star-studded interviews at the age of 24. Since then, his films have been shown collectively in over 150 film festivals, theatrically and on television worldwide, as well as many renowned art institutions. Welcome, Yoni. Hello. <laughs> and so I'd also like to, up next, we have um, our next guest is best known as the leader of the band of men and for the electro-feminist punk band and performance project La Tigre. J.D. Sampson has toured the world, produced songs for Grammy winners, written for publications like Huffington Post, acted, modeled, engaged in direct support with a wide range of progressive social and political causes. Welcome, J.D. Hello. Hi. All right, so we're actually missing Brontes. <laughs> um, he did talk to him about an hour ago. So just text him to make sure that he's not having issues with the link. But um, in the meantime, I can go ahead and first of all, how are you all doing? Good, I'm good. I'm in Brooklyn and uh, it's, it's a fairly quiet day, which is nice. Nice, nice. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started um, and Brontes will join in whenever he's able. I just um, okay, great. Um, one of the first things I wanted to ask. Brontes, um, Brontes says, well, it won't let me in. Huh. <laughs> All right, let me get um, <laughs> I've been waiting for 10 minutes, he says. That is so bizarre, okay. Um, let me resend him a link and and I'll get our um, tech person who's here to go ahead and help uh, assist him. Okay, but one of the first things that I wanted to talk to all of you about was, um, okay, your first experience with queer core and did you even recognize it as queer core at the time? You know, it's, I know it's sort of an amorphous thing and maybe in retrospect you did. Um, for me, I really didn't recognize it as such. I grew up in Cleveland, in the suburb of Cleveland. Um, and to be honest, I came out when I was 15, didn't even drive. And most of the information I was getting about um, queer communities was through mainstream magazines from, that I would read at Barnes and Noble. So um, I looked at the music reviews in um, Out Magazine, The Advocate Curve, which was actually called De Neuve at the time. And um, it was there that I kind of fell into the community of Berkeley through reviews and recommendations. Um, and would go to the local record store, pick up records and kind of start listening. That's, that's amazing. I remember Curve. And, you know, it's so different today with the access to the internet. It's like everything is at our fingertips. So, you know, the way that we kind of encountered things 
um, pre-internet. It's just very different. And what about for you, Yoni? I mean, for me, a lot of it was the music. I remember at the time also, like, La Tigre was big. I remember going to La Tigre concert really young at the Granada Theater in Lawrence, Kansas. And that was, you know, one of my, I mean, I mean that, that band had to have been one of my main injection points into queer core um, and that whole scene. But yeah, exactly. It was pre-internet. So the zines were, for me, huge. And being in public and being at the concerts was what it was all about. Um, and, the, and the films, um, Bruce the Bruce films, but yeah. Um, how did you come across the Bruce the Bruce films? at the time? Um, I'm trying to remember. I think the first film I saw was Hustler White, and I was just kind of shocked. I think it's great um, that when when artists can really, I mean, both Burroughs and him uh, in my head broke taboos using sexuality and playing with sexuality to break all uh, uh, societal kind of uh, mores or, or, or guidelines of how we're supposed to behave and playing on queerness, and I think as a radical act, and I, uh, it was pretty shocking, and it was a great spectacle, yeah. That's really interesting. You know, one of the things like taking away from the documentary and, you know, and all of, you know, all of you and Brontos included whenever he's able to get into the room, it seems like everyone has like a film background <laughs> to some degree, because, you know, Brontos even, you know, I, I read that he did music videos, and I know he did that uh, documentary. Um, and you know, some of like my first experiences with what you know maybe queer core it was seeing La Tigra and Conan O'Brien, mm -hmm. and um, having uh, you know emo skater boys from Wada's introduce me to Gravy Train like on their MP3 player. Yeah. So. Yeah, so it's very interesting about that. Yari, did you have an update on, on Brontes before you look at your phone? Oh, he was just saying that uh, he's stuck in the test your video and audio phase, like it's stuck there. He said, this is what's um, happening. And it shows um, the... Maybe he could restart his browser. Did he try that? Yeah. Yeah, let me give um, his phone <laughs> number <laughs> to our tech person who's in the other room. They could not be more punk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brandes is still the most punk yeah, seven-year-old I know. Really I know. <laughs> he's, he's wild. He, to give everyone a background, he op the, his band Gravy Train opened up for La Tigra. And at that time, you guys had like um, a blog because it was pre kind of like yeah. of social media. And you guys had like a friend. I mean, it was just time of Friendster in my, MySpace. But you guys had a blog and people were still really big on blogs. And, um, and he was, there were all these pictures like, you guys were really pushing Gravy Train and promoting them. And there were all these, I remember these crazy pictures of you guys partying on your bus. And at that time, it was really, there were, I mean, a handful of queer bands that people heard. There was no pop. I mean, today it's taken, you know, every pop act is queer. Every pop act wants to be queer, at least, or has a queer persona. At that time, it was a handful of bands. And so it was a big deal. So all of us queer kids would, were, looking on, were looking up and following your tours on your blog, on the Latigra blog. Oh, thanks. I mean, yeah, we had a tour diary on our website and I remember like keeping up with it. Like each person had to do, uh, you know, every third day or something. And we loved Gravy Train. We actually went on tour with Seth's other band called Panty Raid prior to the inception of Gravy Train. And we took them to Europe and toured all over the States with them as well. And you know, my first memory of Seth's other band Panty Raid was like, oh, you know, they had this van where the, the doors didn't work. So you had to take a butter knife every time you wanted to open the door. And I was like, this is so awesome. This is the most punk ever. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I will say that I think one thing that is so interesting about your film and also this the question you just asked was about how we all have film backgrounds. And to me, in the film, it was amazing how Bruce LeBruce was talking about kind of the fact that he started as a go-go dancer and the reality of kind of growing as like a punk persona through something other than, you know, your art form and just about your attitude is really interesting to me. Like, um, 
and I think that that happened for myself as well. Um, you know, I was, I was punk and I was queer and I was overtly so, and I was against the status quo and I had that attitude. And so therefore, like I was able to kind of be part of this crowd and it wasn't about my talent necessarily, you know? How, how would you, how did you define, or sorry, you're asking the question, but can I ask a question? Oh, I'm just kind of thinking. I will. Is it okay if I ask? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, okay. JD, would, how would you then do, how would you define um, punk? How did you define it then and how would you define it today? Because I was thinking about how the different, how, I mean, even today, the attitudes of punk because of reality television or whatever. I mean, I was like watching Trump and how just dis however disgusting he was. I was like, he he's like this business punk, this right wing punk, this alt alt right is in, even incorporating a bunch of punk attitudes like do what you want not listening to the set. So I, I don't know, how do, you, how do you see it then and today? And is there still room for it to breathe? I mean, that's a huge question. And I think about it all the time because I teach now and I think about the way my students see their work and some of them consider their work punk. And that sometimes I question that because, you know, what is the status quo now is really the question. And I think that all of us are, you know, falling victim or, Pray, I would say to like some aspects of the status quo that we're we're not really aware of, and I think recently No Name and Nikki Blanco have like uh, posted different, you know, uh, I don't know, kind of questions to their fans about whether or not we are kind of um, accepting a capitalist structure, even though we call ourselves punk. And so I think it's important to reconsider what the status quo is right now. Um, but for me, it was always like this inherent, you know, punk was not a sound, it was not a look, but it was a way of being. And um, that's why I think as La Tigra, we were able to like kind of feign this like pop success, even though we weren't Brontes, even though we were punk. At heart. Oh, sorry, that took all fucking day. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy you're here. There's nothing better than like the tech support calls. They're just like, is your internet okay? Like, <laughs> well, right, well, let me go outside and fix it. Like, hi, family. Hey. Love you. Have y'all answered a bunch of questions yet? Or, well, we were just talking about what is punk now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that I find, first, let me quickly introduce Brontes in case anyone tuning in doesn't already know who he is. Um, he's an award-winning author, zinester, dancer, filmmaker, and musician joining us from Oakland, California. His novel, Since I Laid My Burden Down, won the 2018 Writing Award. He's frontman for the punk band Younger Lovers and was a part of the band Gravy Train and is the founder of the Brontos Cornell Dance Company. And um, there's a whole lot more um, for all of you, but I just wanted to give you that little introduction. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, speaking on like what is punk today and, and where do things stand today, what is the status quo, is that a lot of the ethos that were expressed you know, in the queer core documentary by the queer core scene and by kind of like punk, punk subculture in general, um, a lot of those ethos have become almost mainstream now or just part of this large national conversation. And some of those things I think are like largely in part thanks to like the Black Lives Matter movement, like defund the police. Um, but the other concepts like um, free healthcare and even the way um, like gender identity has been discussed in the way that that has evolved over the last 10 years so rapidly and so radically is really amazing that I really felt like these things were kind of part of the fringes that Queer Core explored, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And and here we are, you know, hearing it on like CNN. But I, I had a question with that. <laughs> but so, I mean, that, with that being said, do you still feel like like queer core um, is as vital today um, as it was then since those things that they explored at the fringes is now such 
such a part of our like national conversation or global conversation? Do you still think it's like vital and important? Have we reached the end of the revolution? Essentially, is what you're asking. <laughs> Fuck no, <laughs> like no, <laughs> like when they actually go and defund the police, or like I can reasonably like walk anywhere and like not like feel like I'm gonna get my ass beat. Yeah, like I mean the fact that it's even being presented as the as a topic now means that we're probably 200 years away from it still but it's still like progress, you know what I mean? Um, but I mean, I don't know. Do I feel like we're in a world where like, we're ready to like put these things into action? I don't know. I feel really hesitant to say like, yes. Am I glad that it's even, the subject is even on the table? Like, yeah, I never even thought that that would happen. But like talking about something and it becoming like made manifest into reality. Like, yeah, like that's the hard part, right? So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, do you think that it was it was movements like queer core and and punk and uh, you know a lot of other um, sort of social justice movements that have have I mean it's taken years and years and years, but have brought all of these things to become I guess more comfortable for like the larger mainstream media to talk about. Yeah, I even think, I don't know, like a lot of what I felt like was radical about queer core, like set on like, I don't know, the tenets of like a lot of other like kind of movements that became, you know what I'm saying? There wasn't, there wasn't really queer core without like the feminist movement and like the initial civil rights movement. Like those kids were like taking like the best parts of what they wanted from that language and, you know, filtering it into kind of filtering. I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> You gotta catch up. We were talking before you got here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, with speaking to what you said, it's like, I feel like today things aren't so compartmentalized. There's a lot of talk about intersectionality and how things uh, interrelate with each other. And um, they're, they're not so segregated, and which they shouldn't be. All these things do, do interrelate with each other. Like, you know, Riot Girl was a big part of the Queer Core documentary and um, also was part of like my early introduction to Queer Core when I was younger. And, it, and, you know, I didn't necessarily, when I would listen to it, you know, at first, when I first discovered it, like, okay, these are feminist issues. And then you start to dig deeper and like, oh, these are also, this also has to do with, with um, gender identity and with queerness and it kind of expanded. Um, Yoni, you were going to say something, you were, you were speaking, but I didn't hear your voice through your microphone a little while ago. Oh, I don't know, remember what I was gonna say. Okay, okay. No, I'm, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think when you need language too, like the way we talk about things, you know, like even the word feminist, I was thinking like, why don't we have a better word for anti-patriarchal? Like there's no, you know, all these texts, why don't we have a better word that doesn't include feminine? that still talks about being anti-patriarchal. We don't have anything, you know? So I feel like every, you know, within the realms of theory, academic theory, within the realms of feminism, within the realms of queer activism, within the realms of anti-racism, we always need to be changing diet, changing the wording, changing how we think about things and not getting stuck. And I think somehow punk, Eileen my, Miles defined punk, which is not in the film, in a really interesting way. It just didn't fit, and I had to cut a lot of, uh, 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 of the people out. But she said it's like a, a postmodernist kind of a movement. And if you take it as a postmodernist movement, you can reinterpret it as times are changing and as we're using new language um, to make it relevant and to continue with it. And as you were saying, uh, uh, JC, um, you know, in, interpret it as a, as means within Black Lives Matter to be anti-police because that was super uh, queer core. It was super anarchist. I mean, I, those were those were radical. To see that on a large scale is amazing. Or to, the gay marriage. Now, the you know the commodification of the gay community is not maybe the the most prescient issue that people are still using it as a postmodernist movement to push the boundaries forward. You know, in your uh, interview that you just did for the reporter, you talked about the sort of need for that um, evolution um, of a movement to sort of stay 
relevant. Um, almost like you were talking about how, as if queer core in the way that it was presented in the documentary doesn't exist in that fashion. And um, what you just said just kind of reminded me about that. Um, now, before I move on, I quickly wanted to ask you, Brontes, about what was your first introduction to queer core in your youth, and did you even recognize it as such? Oh, yeah, bitch. Like, I totally recognized it. I think I was 17, and I was still in Alabama, and this older punk dude had the queer the queer core issue of Maximum Rock and Roll from like 92 or 91. I think it was actually like the first one. I still have it in my like chest in my, my garage or whatever, but it was just like the queer core issue. And it was, it was like, it was probably like five or six years out of date. But I remember I saw like vaginal cream Davis, like fucking Bruce LaBruce in this like cop outfit. There was like tribe eight was all in it. Pansy division was all in it. And I was just like, I was like, oh shit, like I gotta get to California. You know what I mean? Like, and I definitely remember, I definitely remember that. Like, um, by the time I got here, I don't think, like it had waned a little bit, but all those people were still there. And then, yeah, like by that time I was filtered into like gravy train or whatever. But then also, I don't know, like we talk about like language and how fast it moves and how fast it evolves. But I mean, also like, I don't know, like it, I feel like there's a crazy like gentrification that happens when language moves like too quick. Cause like when I first moved here, the only person that dared call themselves queer were like these crazy sex working dykes, specifically like sex working dykes. This was like 2002, 2003. And I remember around like 2009, 10, like when it's like, the whole, like when everyone started really using that word more and more, it became like these kind of crazy college educated kids. Like, whereas like, I felt like I learned that language like on the ground and like this kind of framework of like this specific community. And there were kids who were learning the framework in a classroom, right? On the street, in the classroom. When those two people who identify as the same thing meet up, bam, like, we we realized really quickly like why umbrella terms can get really problematic, right? Another thing too, like when language like evolves so quick, it does two things. It keeps the rest of society on its toes, so it has to like learn, but it also specifically keeps the language in the hands of a certain group of people who can dictate what is said, when is said, who knows what and how they know it. So I always like, you know, I always kind of wrestle with, I don't know, these things and these informations and I don't know who's, who is necessarily a bad person because they don't know what cis means. Like, or like, or if when we accept this as the term, I know that it's, my emotional labor is already like intended because since I know it, I'm the one that's going to have to sit there and explain this to like everyone. I'm just saying when I'm like at Christmas at home in Alabama, it can get a little taxing, so we take all of these things on when we, you know, kind of have these conversations, I think, which we should. Yeah, you know, that that reminded me, in the documentary, there's a performance by um, Penny Arcade that they should have clipped, uh, where she kind of talked about the policing of certain terms. It's a little different from what you're speaking on, Brontes, but it's this idea of like, who can use what terms, what's okay, what's not okay, and who controls that. And uh, in, in reference to that, she has this really great kind of statement about queerness, and I wanted to, to talk to you about it. I have the quote right here. Um, she states, losers, freaks, and deviants started the gay liberation movement. Queer means you have no friends. Queer means you have sustained a period of rejection, isolation, and exclusion so profound that it makes that it marks you as an outsider forever. So I wanted to ask how you all felt about that definition. And, um, if you found community in queerness throughout your careers as artists. Judy? Yeah, I mean, for me, a hundred percent. I mean, for me, it was kind of like queer was just synonymous with punk because growing up in Cleveland where I did, um, you know, being queer was against the status quo, period. So I was friends with freaks because I was queer and I was friends with punks because I was queer. 
and I found the queer core movement because I was queer and I was punk, you know? So to me, it was, it was like, I was that outsider. And then what brought me to the understanding of the history slash history of whatever background of the queer core movement was really more queers in college who were outsiders. And so um, I do think that punk like is inherently anti-police and I think that it is inherently violent. You know, that's why um, so much about punk is moshing of what we know about punk is moshing and is dirty and is aggressive. And um, I don't know if this really answers your question, but I think that that's a part of my punk background that I want to get back to, to be honest. That's really fascinating because, you know, that your introduction to that was that queerness was synonymous with punk and that is sometimes not the case with everyone because punk can be so like hyper masculine and mm -hmm. comes with all of that baggage and you know like for me it was like when I was young and discovering punk it was sort of scary and that sounds so masculine and then, and then you find out like oh Darby Crash was gay um like whoa <laughs> you know <laughs> blew my mind or whatever but anyway that's interesting um and it, I'd like to hear what Yoni and Brontus have to say about yeah. that. But see, that's another thing. Like when you say like punk was so masculine, like the ladies weren't fucked up and violent too. Like, <laughs> no, no, uh, they were. Or, a privileged, or a privileged male violence is. I think punk prior to queercore, if you could even say that, because um, I don't really wanna put suggest that there wasn't a movement of queers who liked punk prior to the definition of queer core or a moment of queer core. But I do think that, you know, what people knew of punk was like skinheads and, you know, even maybe prior to, like even in the film, you talk about that a bit. Yeah, prior, Riot Girl also yeah. was, I think, responding to that in a bunch. Um, but I also wanted to say like, we need to consider too, I mean, I've lived abroad, I've lived in Germany, Berlin, Germany right. for the last few years, and noticing language, when you talk about language, it's so American, Amerocentric, and the whole world, I mean, we have a huge world, and they're adopting these terms without fully understanding them, because it's in English, and then it's, it's further perpetuated by the academia, so it's like a white, upper middle class America that is, is conducting the language that people are using but the people on the ground, the people who are actually doing the doing is what Penny Arcade was talking about, I think, in the quote, and what Brontes was talking about, uh, are the people in the streets in, in Oakland. And I think that's what makes youth, that's why I do think that queer core is a youth movement, even though a lot of people would kill me for saying that. And I think there's a lot of importance in leaving things a youth movement, because the great punk saying is like, don't trust anyone over 30. We're, I mean, JD is a professor now, which is great. I teach at the university too. Brontes is finishing his, uh, his master's and will probably be teaching soon too. I, wait, I finished it. <laughs> she finished it. She's teaching. I have a class after this. <laughs> so what I'm saying is like, we're the ones that are now part of the academia, but I mean, we were on the ground doing the footwork so we can give the first hand. We're one of the few probably in our in the institution. But I think it's, I don't know, for me, it's hard to call it a youth movement because I didn't feel like I was part of it because I wasn't in a city where I had a space for underage punk development or something. You know, I was like getting this information from, um, you know, ma mainstream magazines, like I was saying before. And I, even though that was my introduction to it, like it took me a while to really make a connection to the community. And I think, I don't know if Brontes, you agree with this, because I was younger than most of the people who kind of were, were you know, a, a big part of queer core. So it was like, almost like putting a puzzle together. It was like, I'd, I'd meet this one person and be like, oh, this person started this bin. And I'd be like, who's this person and what time? And I'd have to like create this kind of sequence for myself. Um, and I think that there was like a beauty in that, but it, it, it definitely wasn't, I don't know, in terms of just it being a youth movement, I, I didn't experience it that way, really, unfortunately. 
it was always explained to me that punk was a personal revolution, like by older guys who were into it. Like, um, you take what you mean from it. There certainly weren't like lots of queer people around. I met them all through zines. Like there was Kill Rock Stars, and yeah. I was like a Kill Rock Stars kid, and that's how I met my bandmate Seth Bogart, who coincidentally was another gay boy living in Arizona. Like first person I came out to, but like in my immediate vicinity, like yeah, like I don't, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, there wasn't that. I definitely resonate with the idea of it being like this jigsaw puzzle that you were like putting together constantly. And I mean, I guess, I mean, I don't know, like if we can, if we can expand what the term youth means, then yeah, like I would certainly say that like punk is a like youth movement, but I mean, also damn, it's like punk is like what, almost 50 years old now. Like most of the kids I know, like the younger kids I know in their early twenties, like they listen to like rave music. They live in like German techno and like hip hop. Like, but they dress like punks. Like if this, if they were here when I was like here, I would have seen them at shows. But even like the way we like process that music has changed. So I don't. I'm always confused as to what what I'm seeing and what to call it. <laughs> like. <laughs> the, I see, like, yeah, because I, like, look at them and I just, I feel like there's, like, 10 different revolutions going on with them. But, like, <laughs> where they're, like, I mean, is queer core a part of it? Yeah, of course that filtered into their lives, like, somehow. But I don't, I can't always say how I understand it. I personally don't trust anyone under 30 anymore. <laughs> yeah, but I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about the fact that, like, some people say that, like, media hype killed queer core or something like that in the sense that maybe, I mean, maybe people that were involved in the movement at the time weren't really appreciating the mainstream attention that it was getting. Um, And like, you know, how does that shift your punk, you know, ethos? Um, And I think that I've like had that experience. So that's only, that's why I feel like I can talk about it that way of kind of like, oh, now we're on a major label. What does that do to like the point of why we started this in the first place, you know? And so I think that that like, maybe it's just that that self, in, you know, awareness of, of that, there be, that being like this, this moment of tension in yourself that, that kind of like allows for a new revolution in this way. You know, one of the, one of the things that's really exciting about that, which you know, I'm sure is kind of a double-edged sword, is like, you know, your band going on a major label is part of like how it spreads farther. I mean, to me, or I grew up in the small town of Anthony, New Mexico, can see it on television and like have my mind blown, like this exists, and and that's really interesting. But um, when Brontos, when you're talking about, you know, the youth. <laughs> like having sort of multiple revolutions and the definitions of everything becoming amorphous. And I, I think that's sort of the natural um, evolution of things as broad as say what punk was, where, you know, at first it's sort of defined by certain aesthetics and a certain sound, but it's really like a sort of philosophy that can sort of then just be applied to, to anything. And I think queer core kind of has had a similar path and maybe began, you know, if you've seen the documentary with this, uh, uh, association that was more directly connected to what we think of as like three chord punk or whatever. And, um, but definitely has evolved. And I, I think bands like La Tigra and Gravy Train actually are part of that evolution to where we have now you can have like a raver or um, someone making pop music who is queer, but and their queerness informs their pop and vice versa. And it may have some of the same concerns um, and even impact to say queer core did, but it will look and sound nothing like it and maybe not even identify with it. Um, and I, I just have to add, maybe we also have to understand age and time is relative. You know, there was that great book, uh, Cruising Utopia by Jose Munoz about queer temporality and about transcending. So I mean, we know that it's relative and. And so maybe youth is how is a definition, and it's a definition that Penny Arcade is is talking about. Being a grown up is accepting something mentally. It's actually not a, 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 a um, 
uh, uh, in terms of, of how we're dictating age um, and the year thir and 30, 365 days uh, period. But We have a question um, from the audience, which I was going to save towards the end, but this one I thought kind of pertains to what we're talking about right now. Um, we have April Jaffs asking, how do you think youth now are first engaging with queer core? Um, what do you think, how do you think young people's kind of first introduction to queer core is? I don't, I don't, I think one of the ways, uh, I, I'm doing Q and A's, listening to people. It's interesting because there's still a lot of really old school um, queer core, queer punk, riot girl bands all over, all around the world, you know? In, in every small town. So there's the old school way, and then there's hacktivists. I've met hacktivists, like internet activists. There's a collective in Berlin called Pain Collective that started, they started as a riot, as a riot girl band together, and they're doing hacktivism. I mean, of course, there's then a lot of, of stuff going on on Instagram, people learning around through pictures. Um, so I think I've seen a lot of different, different ways of access. It's funny though, because punk in general, and Queercore was such, in my head, a pre-internet phenomena, even though it obviously exists now on the internet. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting to, I, I'm sorry to be so, you know, strict about my definitions, but to me, like, queercore is like a moment in time, and um, queer punk is a whole other thing to me, um, just because I think that it's like, I have a nostalgia maybe for queer course. <laughs> maybe that's why I do it that way. But I think that, you know, people are finding queer punk because there's a lot of it on Instagram and, and um, people are, you know, exploring what the new definitions of punk right now and the new definitions of queer. Um, but I think in terms of the historical, you know, time piece, I would say that you know, many people I think are finding it through Bikini Kill um, reunion tours in general. You know, Team Dress going back on tour was huge. And, you know, I was definitely posting about that. I was posting about Bikini Kill going back out on tour. And I think people are, you know, following that path of breadcrumbs kind of. Yeah. Just like I did, you know? <laughs> yeah, and so it's similar. It's similar, just even though time obviously has changed. So you know, kind of touching on this, um, I'm bringing this up because in the documentary there's a lot of talk um, about where art, you know, art and culture and activism um, collide. And so I think today we're still learning how to navigate, in my, at least in my opinion, um, where politics and culture sort of collide online. So there's all these... <laughs> How do you use our online platforms to discuss these things, um, or even our art, since all of our art ends up online anyway? Um, yeah, what do you what do you all think about that, Brontes? Um, I think the internet both accelerated and completely decimated knowledge all at the same time. <laughs> and back to you, Yoni. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Brontes, you. <laughs> here's why I'm seeing yours because you, you have you have some hot take. Um, I hate the word hot take. I've always been me. <laughs> I've always thought about it harder than the rest of these fucking bitches. Like, and now, like every time I'm like have any like other discourse, it's like a hot take. It's like fuck y'all. Why y'all always trying to spray holes on me? <laughs> Not you specifically, just I like. No, yeah, I know. Right. Your, your career, your your body of work is built on what you know is, I guess, your, is being called a hot take, and you've always explicitly kind of discussed and confronted these issues. But you know, like right now, there's questions of like how people use their online platforms in the sense of like is something performative, um, is is something sincere, is it insincere when discussing race or sexual politics, and like how how do we navigate that today? You know, um, what is the right or wrong thing to do? If you want to know if some artist is authentic, like you probably should go hang out with them and see what they actually do. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, I don't know. Like it's, um, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's like accelerated and decimated knowledge. I see like so many people like, 
I see so many people that know how to like use like any language. They know how to use the language, right? And so you can automatically like believe that they're this person or they're this like activist or whatever. But it's like, I don't know, like you go to their house and they mostly just sit there buying shit off of Etsy. You know, it's not hard to like talk the talk and walk the walk on the thing, you know, like, and so I don't, it does appear that there's, when I go online, I feel like there's more like queers, there's more family, there's more this, that, the other, sure. And like, I don't know, like was queer core successful? Yeah, I see the tenets of queer core everywhere. And my factual reality, if I'm in trouble or if I'm sick or if I need my rent paid, there's still only about six to seven people I can call. For as many people claim to be like queer revolutionaries and artists hacking the system, some of which who I know came from fucking trust funds and shit. I can't really call those people, right? Um, also, I just, um, my community is pretty much the same. And also when we think about queer core, like the initial bands that started it, all those people are still fucking poor. So like, I mean, solidarity is great, but like when you think of in terms of like material return and like, what did this revolution actually do? Did it do a lot more for like the world than it did for the people that started it? Like we have to ask these questions also, like, I don't yeah. know, like what, what, what were the equities of it or? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I, why I was, what I meant when I was saying is leave it a youth movement because the professional professionalization of art, like we see now, you know, you seem to be the only whoever, however we want to define youth to, to, to navigate these kind of realms of subculture and counterculture and uh, of counter societies uh, without having to deal and uh, work in a professional context, how we define pr pr professionalization of music, professionalization of art. I mean, and in America, that's why there's such great, amazing art that's being made because people don't go the professional route. Where I live in Europe, there's tons of money for art and we all get money for art, but you have to be a professional to get it. You have to be able to write a hundred page uh, uh, proposal about your punk band and what, what ramifications it has on society and why it's beneficial to get your tour funded, you know? So you have to have this, I mean, I, and I'm curious about this. I'm, I know a Riot girl band, I'm, who are great. I love them. They're from Berlin, but they're state, they're one of them. I'm state funded here too. They're state funded. So they have, they write these long proposals. They spend all night. They don't get drunk in their basements, you know, playing their instruments, talking about sex and how fucked up, you know, everything is, which I think is, it's a shame that it, it has to be a professional is a professionalization of, of punk and, and of, of the art world in general. Well, I think, you know, bringing up, money is is interesting because because like from my perspective and from the be inception of latira like money wasn't really the the point and i think we all came from backgrounds where like we wanted to challenge capitalism and i think that that's what's interesting about the youth movement right now which i think some may consider punk some may consider it queer like whatever it's called i don't know but there's you know we still are all in the music realm like living under this spotify you know you know, I don't know, whatever, rain cloud. And it's like, to me, the punk move would be to like start your own digital distribution company or, you know, at least think about cooperative um, concepts in music, you know, distribution. So I don't know. I think it's interesting to think about like, yes, the way that we have, you know, as punks, like, taken part in capitalism to some extent and how at some point you do need to be paid for um, your work, but also thinking about ways to do that, that just kind of maintain the idea of punk moving out of the status quo, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I actually have some questions for each of you individually now. So first I'm gonna start with Yoni. Um, Yoni, there's some, probably a lot of pressure to sort of represent a whole movement and it's probably impossible to do so, but it's still something, impossible to like include everyone's story, but it's still something that you kind of pursue in your documentary filmmaking. Um, so I was wondering what motivates you or what drives you to, you know, as a filmmaker, as a documentarian, and 
like looking over the films that you've done, do you do you consider yourself a sort of queer historian by exploring like queer counterculture? I mean, I think what what drives me is what is very rare, and especially in the documentary film world. Um, what drives me is just what Penny Arcade is talking about in her in her monologue in her performance. It's about being rejected and realizing trying to use that rejection as an empowerment and and how and I was reaching out to not only queer people but queer rebels and people I felt that were in similar situations that me as as me and pulled themselves out of it in amazing ways um, and I don't I mean people use the word icons or in you know a, I just think people that, that that can inspire others in in situations where they're being oppressed or or pushed down or feel no avenue to to navigate an, um, in mainstream society and finding ways and finding being able to dig your own tunnels out or, or create your own little caves where you can make your own community um, and that was I think the most yeah important for me. Interesting, thank you, and so. Bronte, um, I actually was very interested in your documentary on Ed Mock. Um, I've only seen the teaser for it. I haven't seen the full thing. Um, but I'll send it to you. <laughs> that would be great. It, it, it's, it, was, it seemed really interesting. Can you briefly talk about who Ed Mock was and you know, if and how Ed Mock kind of inspired the Bronte's Purnell Dance Company and what, and what your dance company is? Well, here's the thing. I didn't know about Ed Mock before I started my dance company. And so oh. it's like, there we go again with that thing of like filling in like puzzle pieces, right? Um, somebody saw my movie Free Jazz and it was one of the women who um, worked with him when she was 13 or 14. And she was like, wow, there was like this postmodernist, like black gay guy who was in the Bay dancing and like had a dance company, like, he came there in like 68 or something and was there until he died in 86. And she saw my work and she was like, oh my God, you remind me of this guy, Ed Mock. And then I heard the name and then I went and like searched the archives and there was a whole bunch of shit there. And like, but of course there was another one, right? Like, I just knew that if I like waited around long enough, like I would hear about the history of somewhere, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like, we're like, our histories are built like really cantankerously, like on a lot of broken bones. And so, like, even, like, in this information age, I think it's so funny, like, just even, like, who gets privileged because they say the right things on, like, Instagram or whatever, like, could be the biggest phony in the world. Meanwhile, like, there's, like, hundreds of histories that have been, like, kind of, like, lost to time, right? So I was really interested in, like, I don't know, like, exploring that and just seeing, like, you know, I don't know, like what he was like, what he was into, and it was really, it was really interesting. The man had a really extensive, crazy, like long career that was really potent. But you know, because there wasn't like an Instagram page on it, we we would just think that all the, all the queers of color here now are the ones who are like getting it like kicked off. But you know, I don't know. It was just, I don't know. It was, it was, it was a really great exercise in archive, in archive digging. Well, you know, and what you're saying, talking about histories kind of reminds me of what you've said before about your writing and um, kind of like, you know, like your story and the stories that you tell are stories that could be lost forever and that they need to be told. Um, and, you know, one of the things I found interesting is like, I, you know, I had known your work as like a musician and then all of a sudden you're like this amazing writer and, <laughs> and everything. And then I found out you've actually been writing um, at a very, like since the beginning uh, at an early age. Um, was there a point where you were like, okay, I'm done with music. I'm going to focus back on writing. Like how did writing kind of come back to be a major player in your life? Or was it always there when you were, you know, making music and, and you just, you know, it's just a matter of what came to the surface. I feel like music is writing, and so is like, um, yeah, music is writing. I think dance is writing. Like it's all. I don't know. It's just like language. It's just like you piss it. Sometimes I want to speak French. Sometimes I want to speak German. That's how I look at it. Okay, interesting. I mean, and that and that makes sense with. I mean, even when talking about like queer core and how you know it it encompasses 
um, film as well as music and performance art and everything. It's like you, you can't just like uh, pigeonhole a philosophy into one form of expression. Well, yeah, my older friends, I had an older friend who was like, she was part of this Riot Girl group in the 90s. And like, I was coming in like way later, but she was like, yeah, like Riot Girl was never just about bands. Like these people were activists. These people were writers. It was filmmakers. It was like a revolution needs all points hit to be like a revolution. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like what we privilege, you know, what we privilege is kind of, I don't know. Or what you hear about first, I think it's kind of like depends on the viewer. Yeah, yeah. And the powers that be, maybe. Um, so, JD, um, I had a question for you um, about your new band, Crickets, that um, you formed with uh, Michael O'Neill and Roddy Bottom from Faith and More. So, in one of your singles, Elastic, um, you talk, you kind of confront your own toxic masculinity, which I thought was really vulnerable and honest and kind of courageous because it's like one thing to call out a system that's larger than you um, but it's another thing to call out yourself and to talk about like where you're responsible in the scheme of things um, and so how did you even like come to recognize that within yourself and um, why did you think that or why did you feel like it was important to talk about well, actually, um, I was writing a book and that was kind of like an experimental autobiography or something, experimental me memoir, I guess is what you would call it. And um, I decided at some point that I would just pull quotes from that book in my jams with my band because it was the first band that I was really in where we were making music in a room through through just like exploring instead of making music on the computer that we then covered for live. So um, I felt really vulnerable in that place um, of just making things up as we played together. Um, but kind of the goal was to not ever take the music to a computer place. So we never recorded it until we recorded in the studio. And uh, that was just one of the things that I had been writing about. Um, in terms of finding the words for that song, I think that like it was all a gestural, you know, automatic writing um, experience for me where, you know, we must admit that we're all part of the systems um, that, you know, many of us are, are um, trying to heal from in this moment. And I think that taking responsibility for my part in it is really, as you said, honest and vulnerable and hopefully will push other people to do the same if they listen to it. But I think all in all, you know, the record really became me saying these personal things that I'll probably never release as a book. So it's just a multimedia experience. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that, and that's one of the things that I see come more from artists who are a little older and who, who are still creating past their 20s um, that they can sort of talk about that they couldn't when, when they were, you know, doing a more punk thing or whatever. And um, it, yeah. it's a sort of maturity. And I think it's, I think that, you know, Movements are, are, you know, maybe relegated to the youth to some degree, but um, there's, I think, a sort of responsibility for um, once that youth grows up to continue to create and share their knowledge and wisdom that they've gained and that they will continue to, um, which is also a part of that song. So I, I have some... Brontes, you provided a link to a video, a Younger Lovers video, Whiskey and Water. Um, I would like to take a second for all of us to watch it. Um, we're coming close on time here, um, but if we could if we could do that and if you could speak to it a little bit afterwards. Okay. Does that sound good? Okay, so when I, um, I'm gonna play this video. I ask that we all like turn off our screens and microphones because it'll be part of the thing and it's sort of weird. And then when it's done, we can turn them all back on. Does that sound good? All right, all right, here we go.
That was from the most recent, the 2017 album, correct? Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's great. Your video, your video is really great. Did, did you have a hand in making that video? I know that you... It's funny because, okay, so check this out. Now, that video was made by Gary Fimbot. And he was um, in this band, Stop Pressed, um, which was this like band on Kill Rock Stars back in the day. I used to watch his videos when I was t a teenager because of the Kill Rock Stars video mailer. But like, he's one of the major like I don't know, super huge queercore filmmaker and like artist here. He's been in the Bay forever. But he's actually the one that shot and edited that video. That's amazing. It was great. I specifically picked that because it was a Gary video. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for speaking to that. Um, so we actually have a really interesting little conversation going on in the chat, um, talking about uh, identity and activist visibility. Um, and Yoni also states um, the, that both of you know JD and Brontes that your physical presentations are quite important, iconic for a lot of people. And that actually reminds me of like a there's a TED talk that you did, JD, which I recommend everyone watching, like if you haven't. It was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> it was so weird. It was like the Cle so, it was like the <laughs> Cleveland TED, and they were like, so talk really slow because we're gonna we we need you to have space between words so we can edit or something like that. So I literally feel like I'm talking like this. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> well, what you said really comes across, and I think kind of um, pertains to that. And it, you talk about tokenism and how that's a double edged sword that it's both patronizing but also kind of really important um, for people who need to see that kind of visibility. And visibility itself is kind of a reoccurring theme throughout all of your musical projects, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, this question, um, you said that you think that there's a benefit to identifying yourself with activist visibility in mind. And then you said, but I also feel that in my experience, it has been very self-affirming to not have to identify as anything but myself. And like, how do you all, all three of you as artists sort of grapple with that? Like, I want to create, or I'm going to create this and it's me. Uh, but also have it sort of be interpreted or ingested by the audience. So this is queer art, you know, this is this type of thing. Do you feel like that puts you in a box? And do you think Yeah, I mean, short answer is like my identity changes. So, you know, the end time and like time changes and, and experience, you know, the world changes around us. So for me being visible as like, a, you know, gender queer, identified woman with a mustache on stage was very sexualized by my community and that's what I wanted in this way. So at that time, it was really, um, 
important for me to take up space on that stage. But then, you know, as time went on and I got older, I was like, I want to stop being sexualized now. Can we stop that? You know, so it's like, then I don't need to be on that stage identifying exactly how I was or whatever. And I think that that's, that's just how we all travel on this weird journey. Yeah, and you know, and Brontes, in your earlier gravy train days, you did a lot of like kind of go-go dancing on stage, I believe, right? And your body, you know, your nude body was very much a part of everything um, when talking about being sexualized on stage. Um, but also, Brontes, you were, I mean, at that, I mean, your core was pretty damn white, other than vaginal Davis and, and Tantrum briefly in Tribe 8. You know, so I think also, Bront has pre you pre presented presented that for people, which people hadn't, which was really important. It was such a new realm to be in. I can honestly say that I think I probably shut that part of myself off a little bit in order to be able to do that. And also even in like people like to this day, like will be like, wow, like I was so young. That was such a sexual thing to see. You were the first black naked guy I ever saw. In my head, I really thought that we were making fun of sex and like lampooning sex. It never occurred to me. It honestly never occurred to me that anyone would see that and want to jerk off. Like just cause I, that was just not the headspace I was coming from, you know? Um, but then I don't know, like we say, as the world changes around us, we change. For one instance, like, yeah, I no longer refer to myself as like a, a, a queer person of color. I just say I'm a black old school homosexual now. Um, <laughs> that feels more freeing in my soul now and more specific. Cause yeah, I fight with umbrella terms the older I get. But also like, as we, uh, when the more we think about ourselves, the less we think about other people, right? So like artists are, are already inherently thinking about themselves and as we fight for our own rights and we're presenting our own, our own images and ourselves over and over, we stop seeing other people on the, you know, just more well, and more. Well, it like helps because I don't know, like tw who would refer to themselves as a queer person of color like 20 years ago as opposed to now? Like, yeah, like how, yeah, I had to telescope back a bit and be like, okay, this is definitely black. This is definitely homosexual. This is something archaic. You know what I mean? Like, just to like put it into reference. Like, I don't know. Like, now I don't know. Like, <laughs> let me not start I mean, another what, conversation. Like, like, <laughs> but, like, what do we? But what do we do when things change? Like JD's presentation of a non, what I would consider a non-binary person before the term even existed. And then non-binary is now, you know, a thing. We see it on TV everywhere. And then so what, you know, where do you go? What's the next step? Well, for me, there's a freedom in the fact that, like, my job here is done in this way. I mean, I know that sounds fucked up, but it's like, wow, here's the torch. Have fun. Like, really? <laughs> and I mean that, like, in all sincerity, like, have fun. Like, I did have so much fun. And, like, such an awesome, beautiful family developed, you know? And, um... But I'm 42 and like, I don't believe that I need to center my voice right now. So that's just where I'm at. That is uh, incredibly insightful. Cause I think, yes, and all, all of our kind of um, identities and politics will shift and grow um, throughout the years. But, um, you know, when you, when I, you know, like when I talk about seeing you on Conan, that these terms you, that we use today did not exist then um, at all. And so. I didn't have a computer then. Yeah. <laughs> or a cell phone. It's you crazy. spent the Bush years wilding. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we like. I like maybe went to the library to look at a message board or something, but like, come on. I mean, it's just so different. It's like, we met up, we met up. That's incredible. Um, well, thank you all for sharing your incredible, insightful thoughts. Um, if anyone has any quick questions, I'm sorry if I haven't addressed everything here in the chat, um, feel free. Otherwise we,
we'll call it good. And, and while I wait, I'm actually gonna take a second to plug everyone um, on their, you know, behalf. I, I really, because I really like all of our presenters' work. So Yoni, your film, um, you talked about, you know, you did the best that you could do, but there were some limitations with who you could get on screen, who wanted to be on screen and who didn't and everything. So you've expanded Queer Core into a book. Um, yeah, and, and Brontes is in the book. And JD is wrote a really, our first top blurb. So they're both. It's so good. The book is so good. Okay, so everyone should be seeing the book on their screen now with a buy now link. I think it's it's a pre-order actually, right, Yoni? Until yeah, January. it got delayed because of Corona. You yeah. should have been out already. But um, pre-order that, and I'm I'm gonna pre-order it. I look forward to reading it. So I'm going to. You can also Google it. It's the same title: Queer Core Had a Punk Revolution: An Oral History. Um, now our next is another book. Let's talk about. Bronte has 100 boyfriends. Okay, so everyone should see that on their screen. It's Bronte's next book. Uh, is there anything that you can talk about with it's it? It's also a film, Bronte. I saw you screened that at Outfest before my, uh, the film before Queer Core, right? Didn't you, 100 Boyfriends? That was 100 Boyfriends mixtape. 100 Boyfriends mixtape is the film series. 100 Boyfriends is the book. Um... The dedication page says, fuck all y'all. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to talk about how I feel about the 100 boyfriends. We can leave it at that. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> if anyone listening hasn't had the opportunity to read Brontes' work or um, listen to him read his own work, I highly recommend you go check that out. It's an experience to behold. Um, so, and... We talked earlier about JD's new band, uh, Crickets. And so here we go. You should see that on your screen. Um, that is the digital, and I'll put up the, the physical if you're into records and all of that, um, that you formed with Michael O'Neill and Roddy Bottom, correct? JD? Yes. Sorry, oh. I was responding to you. Um, yeah. It's an exercise in restraint. That's very interesting. And I think that, that definitely comes across musically in all of the tracks. Um, whoops, whoops, hold on. I clicked the wrong thing. So here is the physical if you're into records. And can you talk a little bit really quickly about the label that it's on? Yeah, we're on this community uh, just like local label, punk label called Mud Guts. Um, they release um, Cher. What's Cher's last name? She's from Oakland. Skateboarder. A strawberry. Yeah, Cher Strawberry. And um, Come Girl 8. And uh, yeah, some other rad bands. Um, but they're a cool punk label that we collaborated with on the on the record and uh, Alicia McCarthy did the artwork. And actually we did a art project where we had four visual and performing artists um, enact uh, one, uh, sorry, stem from the song and Brontes did one of them. Uh, so I should send that to you as a link, but I didn't. Okay, cool. <laughs> for talking about all of that. You also um, wanted to um, share a donation link for the Activation Residency Co-op Fund, and that should be on everyone's screen. Can you briefly tell us what that is about? Yes, it's a co-op fund that started as a residency, and now they're um, starting to build land co-ops. Um, and yeah, you can check out their Instagram and find out more. They also have some amazing workshops coming up. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to shout them out. That's really cool. I, I, I'm actually gonna put the other link in the thing. In the chat, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, it's not on our, it's like, you won't see it on our screen, but it should be on everyone else's screen too. But yeah, please put it, put it in the chat. Um, okay, brilliant. So, 
thank you everyone for being a part of this. I'll wait till JD gets that in the chat. Um, that was in incredibly insightful. And, you know, I, I picked all of you because I really feel like you're part of this transitional, uh, transitional part of queer core from, you know, what we see mostly in Yoni's documentary and then what we see today. And I think that's a really interesting space to be in. Um, and I look forward to continuing to see what you all produce. Thank you for thank having you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. All right, so everyone, um, if you had any connection issues throughout the program, this is all recorded and archived and you'll get an automatic link uh, in your inbox once it's done um, uploading. And if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out to me or to the CCA uh, via email. And you can find that on our website, ccasantafe.org. All right. Have a good afternoon, everyone, and Yoni, a good night to you. Oh my God, I oh. forgot. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope to see you guys all in real life at some point, too. I know, let's have a party. Yeah. Party. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, family. Love y'all.